I'm John Pellerito, and I'm going to talk about the diagnosis and treatment of pseudoaneurysms and arteriovenous fistulas. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to describe the findings associated with these two entities that usually occur after femoral artery injuries. We'll talk a little bit about thrombin injection for treatment of pseudoaneurysms and some of the complications that can arise. And I'm going to finish up by showing some challenging cases. So most of you know that iatrogenic femoral artery injuries occur up to about 2% after procedures, and the incidence is related to use of larger catheters, more complex procedures, and the use of anticoagulation. Early diagnosis is obviously important to avoid potential complications. And some of those complications include hematoma, pseudoaneurysm, AV fistula, arterial dissection, and arterial thrombosis. And these things can then in turn cause local pain. You can have an uh, infection be related to the procedure. Obviously, you can have uh, nerve or venous compression, distal ischemia, and if you have a large AV fistula, the patient may have congestive heart failure. Now, most of you have seen pseudoaneurysms. You recognize these as vascular masses connected to the underlying artery, usually the femoral artery after a femoral puncture by a track or a neck. And again, this results from a hole in the wall from the procedure, which allows the escape of blood under pressure, which is then confined by the surrounding soft tissues and hematoma. And this image was created by one of my sonographers. Uh, we love using B-flow. Uh, you really can see the hemodynamics of a lot of vascular abnormalities, and this shows the swirling that in occurs inside the pseudoaneurysm cavity. Now, studies have shown that probably the most important predisposing factor for the formation of a pseudoaneurysm is insufficient manual compression. After the procedure, less than five minutes of compression increases your risk. Obviously, the more complex the procedure, the greater the risk of pseudoaneurysm. So use of intraortic balloon pumps, uh, arteriovenous hemofiltration, stent placement also increases your risk. So here's another example of a pseudoaneurysm. Obviously, in real time, we see the swirling. You've seen a couple of examples of this already. Uh, we showed you one with, with regard to a renal transplant. After a procedure, you get that classic yin-yang pattern. And again, you want to look for the track or the neck that communicates between the underlying artery and the pseudoaneurysm cavity. In real time on color Doppler, you can see the to and fro that occurs. Blood flow goes into the cavity during systole because of the higher pressure gradient. And then as the pressure reverses, you have reversal of flow back into the underlying artery. You can see that on color Doppler because the color changes from red to blue. And you can easily see it with pulse Doppler when you place the sample volume in the neck where those changes become very obvious. Forward flow, then reverse flow according to the cardiac cycle. Now, you can have complex pseudoaneurysms with multiple loculations. Here's an example of multiple locules in series. And it's very important when you scan these patients that you identify the underlying artery and vein. That way you don't miss part of the abnormality. And no matter where you sample across that chain of pseudoaneurysms, you will see to and fro flow. And obviously, they can occur in different locations. Here's a patient that has a large pseudoaneurysm after an axillary puncture. And this was treated with a balloon because this was not deemed to be com compatible for a thrombin repair because it wasn't entirely visualized. So there are a number of different treatment options for pseudoaneurysms. Uh, first, you can take a conservative approach and see if the pseudoaneurysm will spontaneously thrombose. And I will do that for pseudoaneurysms that are a centimeter or less. Although I don't have any series that confirms the value of using the one centimeter cutoff, this is something I've been doing for years and it seems to work pretty well. Many of these will spontaneously go away when they're small. Obviously, if they're complex or not amenable to thrombin injection or compression repair, they may go on to surgical repair. Ultrasound guided compression repair was possible years ago, but we no longer do those because those same patients are typically amenable for thrombin injection. 
and for those unusual cases like the one I just showed you when we had that large axillary pseudoaneurysms, though may go to the interventional suite and have a balloon occlusion or other similar technique. Here's a study that was done by Eric Paulson years ago where he looked at several factors to see which pseudoaneurysms would spontaneously thrombose. And he came up with some factors, small size, long narrow neck, uh, the age less than a month, but he concluded there really weren't reliable color Doppler features to determine which pseudoaneurysms will spontaneously thrombose. A similar study was also done looking at other factors, and in this study, the only factor that was felt to be reliable, uh, according to this author, was the length of the neck that was less than one centimeter. It was a relatively large series from the Journal of Vascular Surgery, which looked at 196 pseudoaneurysms, 81 AV fistulas, and nine combined lesions to see which ones required surgical repair and which ones can be followed to see if they would spontaneously thrombose. The ones that went on to surgical repair were the ones that should be treated that way because they were very large or they were expanding, causing severe pain or nerve compression, or couldn't be followed up. So those patients were treated by the surgeon. The others were followed. And that was a group of 147 vascular abnormalities. And you can see that 89% of the pseudoaneurysms in this series spontaneously thrombosed. And maybe a little surprisingly, 81% of the AV, AV fistulas, these very high flow states, also spontaneously thrombosed. 14% of that group ended up going to surgery, and there were no significant complications. Which brings me into the discussion of thrombin repair, which is really our mainstay for the treatment of pseudoaneurysms. Obviously a non-operative alternative, and for these we use a relatively small needle, a 22 gauge needle that we place into the pseudoaneurysm cavity directly under ultrasound guidance. And in this image you can see the needle very well with its tip placed within the cavity. Once you've identified the needle location, then you can inject the thrombin directly into the cavity while we watch, typically with color Doppler on. And in most cases, we experience immediate thrombosis of the pseudoaneurysm. And we have found it to be very fast and effective treatment for these lesions. One of the first articles that came out describing the technique came from Kang and his group in the Journal of Vascular Surgery. We had, he had a series of 21 pseudoaneurysms. 20 of these were successfully treated with one cc or less of thrombin. Again, injected directly under ultrasound observation. Most of them treated under 20 seconds, five of which required a second injection. And in his initial study, he described no complications or recurrences. When we do these procedures, we have to typically assess the anatomy of the pseudoaneurysm in a similar manner that we did for ultrasound-guided compression repair. We want to assess the location, the size, and of course the neck. We'll discuss the procedure with the patient and in obtain informed consent because of the possibility of a complication. We don't give any premedication, and anticoagulation is not a contraindication. We published this series years ago, and this was a series of 40 consecutive patients that all had initial thrombosis after thrombin injection. In this series, we used an injection of just about half a cc with a 22-gauge needle. One of these patients required a second injection because it was a complex lesion, and we had one complication. We had a recurrence in the same patient um, because the needle tip wasn't very well seen, patient eventually had a thrombosis of the underlying artery, and after treatment in the interventional suite, developed a second pseudoaneurysm. So very important lesson learned there that you need to know where the lesion tip is before you do the injection. Here's one of our cases. Again, you can see the pseudoaneurysm arising from the common femoral artery. The, the neck was well visualized, and after the injection, you can see it's been converted to a hematoma. There's no flow in the lesion, and we document patency in the underlying artery and vein after the injection. Here's another example. Here's a bilobed pseudoaneurysm. The arteries down here is the common femoral artery above the bifurcation. Here's one locule. Here's a second locule. And again, the objective here is to place the needle in 
the most proximal collection because after the thrombosis of that lesion, the no flow will go into the more peripheral locule. So you can thrombose that pseudoaneurysm with a single injection. And here with the color turned off, you can see the tip of the needle. And here I'm just going to show you on these clips what it looks like. Here we have a pseudoaneurysm. The neck is over here. And here, it, with the color turned off, you can see we punctured the pseudoaneurysm cavity, and there's the tip of the needle. Okay, so I think it's very important to turn the color off so that you can see the needle tip very well. Then once you've identified the needle and you feel comfortable about its location away from the neck, then you can go ahead and turn the color back on. And what you can see here is the gush of thrombin with the color turned on and the immediate thrombosis of the cavity after which you can withdraw the needle. And you can see how quickly that occurs, that in just a matter of seconds, in a single collection, you have immediate thrombosis of the cavity. Here's another example. It's about a two and a half centimeter pseudoaneurysm. Here's the neck. And again, in real time, you can see the needle tip. Here's the injection. And just in a matter of seconds, it is completely thrombosed. Eric Paulson published uh, another series years later where he compared his results between ultrasound guided compression repairs and thrombin injections. And although he had many fewer thrombin injections in this series, I think the data makes sense in that you have a higher success rate, 96% compared to 74% with ultrasound guided compression repair. These numbers are very similar to ours when we looked at our initial series. The time of treatment is six seconds compared to 42 minutes, but that doesn't take into account the time of preparation for the thrombin repair, including the, the reconstitution of the thrombin. And in this series, he describes no complications. There was a series that came out of Boston where they looked at 54 pseudoaneurysms that they treated with thrombin and found that for all the simple unilocular pseudoaneurysms, of which there were 45. They were all successfully treated with a single injection, with no complications, and felt there was no need for ultrasound follow-up. But in his group of complex, multilocular pseudoaneurysms, four out of the nine were failures because it required more than a single injection. And he concluded after reviewing these cases that, of course, he should be injecting the most proximal lobe because if you can knock that out, then, of course, you can thrombose the entire collection. So that's, of course, really the optimal strategy when you have a complex pseudoaneurysm. These cases, he recommended ultrasound follow-up because he felt they were more complex. In my series, we always do follow-up, and I'll show you why in just a few moments. Now, here's a very large pseudoaneurysm. It's about a nine centimeter bilobed pseudoaneurysm, and you can see flow in both cavities. And again, what I'm going to do here is I turn the color off, I place the needle tip, you can see the arrow in the more proximal lobe, and after injection, I've just completely thrombosed this very large pseudoaneurysm. Now, we've also treated pseudoaneurysms away from the groin, and this was one I have to say I was a little reticent to treat initially. This is a 28-year-old girl with lupus and had a radial artery pseudoaneurysm after an arterial puncture. And I have to say, I was a little concerned when they asked me to do a thrombin injection of this radial artery pseudoaneurysm. And I only offered to do it in the presence of the vascular surgeon who wanted the procedure. And I said, listen, if I have a problem, at least you're there to take the patient to surgery. And, I'd like to, and I'm happy to say it went pretty well after the injection. You can see we had a complete thrombosis, and the radial artery was patent afterwards. But I would, con I, I would be careful in cases like this because the risk is probably higher, particularly when you don't have a very well-defined pseudoaneurysm neck. This is our series that we published this year looking at recurrence rates because there's nothing in the literature to say how often do these things come back. So we looked at 262 consecutive cases. Our overall success rate for thrombin repair was 86%. And our recurrence rate was almost 11%. I was surprised that it was so high. Because as many of these cases go on, and I don't see them all, and I certainly not, I don't get follow-up in all of these, and we found that of these 11% of recurrences, we found that the factors that were, seemed to be the most important were large pseudoaneurysm size and thrombocytopenia. 
Our complication rate was 3%, uh, and this was related to five cases that had vascular thrombosis and two that ended up developing an infection. So here's one of those cases. Here's an, a, a, one of our recurrences. And here's a 62-year-old status post-cardiac cath. And this was a complex femoral artery pseudoaneurysm. The arteries down here, here's one locule, here's a, a second, and then a third. So you can see there's three together. And there's the to and fro flow. And we injected it in the most proximal lobe, right down by the neck. And we injected there. And you can see that, as is often the case, there's a little bit of a residual neck because we're not injecting into the neck. We try to avoid the neck because if you inject toward the neck, then you run the risk of getting the thrombin into the underlying artery and thrombosing the artery are causing distal embolization. So seeing a residual neck is fairly common and that's one reason why we follow them. And in follow-up, we saw that there was, that this neck grew a, a small new head and it required treatment once again. And here's the follow-up, we retreated it and it did not recur a second time. Now, Lennox in, in the Journal of Vascular Surgery described the complications that may occur. And we already talked about the potential for arterial occlusion when you inject toward the neck, or you may have embolization of thrombin material causing distal occlusion. And he felt that these major complications may be related to the dose, the rate, the size of the neck, and the location of the needle tip. And although it may be related to the dose or the rate, I, don't th I think those are very minor factors. I think what you really need to be careful with is the size of the neck and making sure that you define a neck and the location of the needle tip as we already discussed. Interestingly, he described a technique of compressing the neck during the injection which kind of makes sense. It's a combined compression repair when you do the injection, so you can't get contrast in the neck if it's compressed. And I've tried it, but I found it to be uncomfortable for the patient, for myself, changed the anatomy a little bit, and probably completely unnecessary, as I've never had that complication. But I do avoid cases like this. Here was a case that was sent to me for a thrombin repair, and I said, where's the neck? If you can't define a neck, then the risk of causing a complication is going to be much higher. And I think this is really a rent or hole in the artery rather than uh, a pseudoaneurysm with a neck. And yes, it is a pseudoaneurysm, but I don't think it's amenable to thrombin injection. I sent this one to surgery. Now I'm going to show you another case that we did treat, which I didn't treat it, but I have to say, uh, because the neck is so small, and clearly a pseudoaneurysm and is a fair amount of peripheral thrombus. You could see the yin-yang flow in the center of the cavity and a very short neck that arises from the common femoral artery. So what I'd like you to do is pay attention to this injection. You can see the needle tip very well. It's kind of pointing toward the area of the neck, but it's not in the neck. But watch what happens with the, when it's injected. It goes directly into the artery. Okay, which is exactly the thing that we want to avoid. Okay, and for dramatic effect, I'll let you watch it again because you're not going to. You, hopefully, you'll never see this again. This is the thing you want to avoid. Okay, the good news is that there was thrombosis of the pseudoaneurysm, and there were no complications. The patient was followed for, for a couple of days. There were no immediate symptoms. There were good distal pulses, and when we had the patient come back the patient was fine. So I think he got away with one, but I think that's the kind of thing to have to be careful about. Okay, let's talk to a few moments about arterial venous fistula, which again is another complication of femoral artery puncture, just a little less common. Um, we typically see them between the common or deep femoral artery and the common femoral vein. And again, as I mentioned before, if they're really large, then you run the potential for congestive heart failure or local is or distal ischemia. And we all know about fistulas, right? These are communications directly between the artery and the vein, and you're going to see continuous forward flow across the, the pr a pressure gradient from the artery to the vein. Very low impedance, high velocity flow is typically what we see. When the connections, the fistulas themselves are very small, very tight, we get very high velocity flow, and we get vibration of the surrounding tissues, right? We see a color brewery artifact on our color display. 
And many times what we have to do is freeze the image in diastole to actually see the communication because in Sicily there's all that color flash. So here's another example of a fistula between the femoral artery and vein. And as you'd expect, when you sample the artery, you lose the high-resistant triphasic pattern at the side of the fistula. It's now a shunt pattern because it's going from the high-pressure artery to the veins, so it's a low-resistance pattern in the artery. And the venous side no longer having that nice phasic flow pattern, but is now pulsatile like the artery. So here's an example of a 58-year-old status post-cardiac cat that presented with the right pelvic swelling. And this is a nice one because it's a relatively large fistula between the external iliac artery and vein. Obviously, the puncture was a little high. And we can see the classic changes in the artery and the vein. The artery is no longer triphasic, as we would expect in the iliac artery. It's got a low resistance pattern. And when you sample the external iliac vein, it's arterialized. So very simple diagnosis. And if you place the sample volume within the fistula, you get very high velocity flow. Here it's close to 500 centimeters per second. Now, let's get into some more interesting, complicated cases. Here's a 54-year-old with a right groin mass status plus cardiac cath. Now, you clearly can see a classic pseudoaneurysm. Frozen in time, it's a beautiful yin-yang pattern. But what else do you look at? I mean, the thing is, these are the things that my sonographers may miss or get confused by because they may just stop at the more obvious finding. On this particular image, it's also very easy to see that there's also a communication between the artery and the vein. And what makes this more complicated in real time is the tremendous Bruy artifact that's occurring at that location. So by freezing it in diastole, you lose a lot of the noise, and you can see the abnormalities really well. So here we, we're looking at this combined pseudoaneurysm, AV fistula, which can occur, particularly when there are multiple punctures. And, you know, July and August, when all the new residents and fellows come on board, we tend to see more of these abnormalities due to the fact that there are mul multiple groin punctures for a single procedure. And here on the site of the fistula, we have a high-velocity, low-resistance pattern. And in the neck of the pseudoaneurysm, we get classic to-and-fro flow. And this one we treated with thrombin because the neck was away from the fistula and we had a good result, you could see, and then we waited for the fistula to spontaneously thrombose. Okay, let's take a look at this case. This is a little trickier. Here's a 74-year-old, status post groin catheterization, presenting with a pulsatile groin mass, so classic history, rule out pseudoaneurysm, and this is what we see. So these are the images obtained by my, my sonographer, and we could see that there's this lobulated abnormality arising from the femoral artery. And, you know, my, my sonographers, they love B-flow. They love power Doppler. It's great. Give us great images. And, of course, they have to sample the neck. And here's the sample that was obtained in the neck. And there's the waveform. And you can see how it's labeled. Clearly, they thought it was a pseudoaneurysm and may have thought that this was to and fro flow. Maybe some of you think it's to and fro flow, but it's not. Because with to and fro flow, you have a forward and reverse alternating component. They don't occur at the same time. This is more of a mirror image artifact, where you have the same arterial component above and below the baseline. So it's not a to and fro waveform. And probably the take home point here is that if you don't get a to and fro flow waveform in the neck, then don't call it a pseudoaneurysm, because that's probably not what it is. So although it was thought to be a pseudoaneurysm, I was very suspicious of that, because the waveform wasn't right. So I went back in, and I found that it's actually a complex arteriovenous fistula. And although you may think that's semantics, it makes a whole lot of a difference when you decide how you're going to treat it, because you don't want to stick a needle full of thrombin in that cavity, because I can tell you exactly where it's going to go. 
And you figured that out. So when you place the sample volume now, and you see without the mirror image, it's clearly a high velocity, low resistance pattern that it is a fistula with a small pseudoaneurysm component built into it. Now, one more case. Here's an 85-year-old with a pulsatile groin mass. And this is even more confusing, I think, for the group looking at it, because it, the anatomy is hard to see, right? When these patients get punctured, especially multiple times, there's a lot of swelling, there's a lot of pain over the site, and it may be difficult to image. So here, you know, the still image that was given to me, and then when I went back and looked at it, because I couldn't figure out what they were showing me. And I see a little, this, like, sparkling there, and... I say, well, I'm not sure what that is. It kind of looks like a pseudoaneurysm. And I went in there and took a waveform, and that's what I saw. So I said, well, certainly not to and fro. Not exactly sure what I'm looking at yet. So looking around, I have this sort of color rain over the site of the puncture. And of course, that's the key to doing these studies. Look for the puncture, and you put the probe on top of it. You don't have to go fishing around looking for the abnormality. You go at the puncture site. And at the puncture site, you see all this color rain. And so I sample around that, and you could see I get this sort of arterialized flow pattern. So here's a little bit of a clearer image. What's the diagnosis? Now you're starting to see the communication. Right? You're starting to see the loop that's going on here and why we got such a low resistance flow pattern because it's not a pseudoaneurysm but a very complex arterial venous fistula. Okay? So it took, it took a few minutes to get that image because of all the artifact and because of the pain and the swelling. But clearly, a, it's a fistula and that, we're not going to treat this with thrombin. Okay, so I'm going to conclude here. My time's up. Duplex and color Doppler, valuable for the diagnosis of pseudoaneurysm and AV fistula. Helps us to distinguish other causes of pulsatile groin mass, such as a hematoma. And as you've seen and probably know, that thrombin injection is rapid and effective treatment for the repair of pseudoaneurysms. Thank you very much.